Okay, I'm going to start with a question from uh, James Cook of the BBC. Thanks very much indeed. Over to your left, if you're looking down. Yes. Thank you. Um, for years, for years, the SNP complained bitterly that right-wing policies were imposed on Scotland against the country's wishes. Now, you're effectively saying you want to impose left-wing policies on England, possibly against its wishes. Are you not basically a hypocrite who's holding the UK to ransom? Um, I, I take a very different view of that. I'm not seeking to impose policies on anybody. I'm seeking for support in Scotland for the manifesto that I am publishing today. And I'm saying very clearly that I want to seek to build common cause and to forge alliances with people of like mind across the UK so that we can win more progressive change. Uh, I, as you know, James, uh, fought the referendum campaign last year with all my heart and soul. Uh, I campaigned hard for a yes vote. Uh, during that campaign, politicians from Westminster came to Scotland as it was entirely their right to do and urged Scotland, uh, and I think this is a direct quote, not to leave the UK, but to lead the UK. Now, Scotland did not vote in the referendum to become independent. Uh, we remain part of the Westminster system, and therefore I think it is entirely legitimate and I think it is important for Scotland that we seek to make our voice heard in that system and to encourage and to use our influence to encourage the Westminster system to take better decisions because as long as we remain a part of it it matters to people in Scotland that the decisions made at Westminster are good decisions and that's why I say to people watching in other parts of the UK that it is in the interests of the SNP speaking up for Scotland to work constructively in that system to make it better. And I happen to think as we do that, we can get better politics and better policies for people right across the UK who are as desperate for change as people in Scotland are right now. <laughs> James, James Matthews from Sky. First Minister, you're a party that supports Scottish independence. You are talking about cooperation with MPs in the north of England and in Wales. Not content with breaking Scotland out of the UK, are you now pencilling political fault lines elsewhere around the UK? And second of all, can I ask your reaction to what Boris Johnson has had to say this morning? That giving giving the SNP power in a Westminster government would be like putting King Herod in charge of a baby farm. Okay, I did say you might not like some of the questions and that is not uh, the fault of, of Mr Matthews from Sky. Um, can I say in, in response to, to that, first of all, I haven't heard the comments of Boris Johnson directly this morning, so um, it's perhaps uh, not entirely fair of me to comment on them. But if he did say that, then that's an entirely offensive comment. And I think it will be treated as such, not just by people in Scotland, but people across the UK, who in my experience uh, of ordinary people, the length and breadth of the UK, do not see Scotland in that way at all, and do not even see the SNP in that way at all. In terms of the first part... <laughs> in terms of the first part of your question, the, the short answer is no. I'm not seeking in this election to create division with or between anybody. I make no secret uh, of the fact that I want Scotland to be an independent country. But I'm a Democrat. Scotland did not vote to be independent last year. And if Scotland is ever to become independent, then a majority of people in Scotland need to vote for that in a referendum. Right now, we remain part of the UK. We remain part of the Westminster system. And therefore, my interest is in seeking to build alliances across the UK for better politics and for better policies, because that will help people in Scotland. And as a politician, I have spent my entire political career arguing for what I consider to be in the best interests of Scotland. People will not always agree that what I argue for is in the best interests of Scotland, but that is entirely my motivation. So in this election, I am 
offering to people elsewhere in the UK a genuine hand of friendship. I'm not trying to hide my political beliefs as far as independence is concerned, but I am saying very clearly we can work together to get the change that people in Scotland want and, in my experience, many, many people across the rest of these islands want as well. I accept the responsibility to be the one to persuade people in other parts of the UK that my entreaties in that regard are genuine and I take that responsibility seriously. It matters to Scotland to get better policies at Westminster and if we can use our voice to do that, we benefit people not just in Scotland but everywhere across these islands as well. And I'll go next to Brian Taylor from BBC Scotland. First Minister, thanks very much indeed. The point you made there about cooperating, taking that point. David Cameron, nonetheless, is saying it would be a frightening prospect if your party has influence on the governance of the UK. If we take that to its ultimate logic, is it possible, is it feasible, is it even desirable in your view that Scottish independence might come about through the back door of English disquiet rather than the front door of Scottish determination? Okay, I was actually um, in the wings of a television studio watching uh, as David Cameron made those comments in the BBC in London yesterday. I'm told, although I'm not sure if it's true, but I'm told that he uh, was not keen to sit next to me on the sofa of the BBC while he made the comments. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave he, him to confirm or deny if that was the case. Yeah, I go back to what I said earlier on. David Cameron was one of those politicians who entirely legitimately sought to persuade and ultimately successfully persuaded people in Scotland to vote against independence on the basis that Scotland's voice could and would be heard within the Westminster system. If Scotland chooses now, as it is democratically entitled to do, to make its voice heard by voting SNP, then it is completely outrageous and unacceptable for any Westminster politician to say to Scotland that that's not acceptable. It's tantamount to saying your voice will be heard as long as you vote the way we want you to vote. And that's not democratic. And secondly, lastly on the point about independence, let me make crystal clear there is no back door to Scottish independence. There is only the route of persuading a majority of people to vote for independence in a referendum. There is no back door, there is no shortcut, there is no easy route. And I, and I take this responsibility very seriously. I will spend every day that I am privileged to hold the office that I hold in seeking to persuade people in other parts of the UK that notwithstanding that they might disagree with the SNP on the question of independence, that we can nevertheless be allies for progressive change. That's what I have sought to do in this campaign so far. It is what I will seek to do for every remaining day of this campaign, and it's how SNP MPs will conduct themselves in the House of Commons for each and every day that they're given the privilege of serving there. SCV. Nicola, full fiscal responsibility, as it's now called, made it onto the second last page of the manifesto, but it is in there, so will you now give us full costings? And will you also detail where money is coming from for pledges like £9.5 billion for the NHS? Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, full financial responsibility, first of all, I said in my opening remarks that is something that we will seek uh, agreement on. Full fiscal and financial responsibility is of course about giving the Scottish Parliament the powers to grow our economy, the powers to create revenues, get more people into jobs so that they're paying taxes and our revenues are growing. Even if we reach an agreement on full fiscal responsibility, we know from the experience of the Calman Commission it will take several years for that to be fully implemented and that uh, is the reality we know from experience. It's therefore irrelevant to use, as the opposition do, a figure 
from now. It's no more relevant than it would be if I picked a figure from one of the seven out of the last 10 years when Scotland's been in a stronger fiscal position than the rest of the UK. Our fiscal position when Scotland uh, becomes fiscally and financially responsible, autonomous, will depend on our economic growth between now and then. It will depend on the detail of the fiscal framework that is agreed and in that SNP MPs will have a critical part to play in getting the best deal for Scotland. And as part of that transition, what I want to do is win as many powers in the key areas for Scotland as possible. Powers over employment, the minimum wage, business taxes, to get more people into jobs and to grow our economy. Because the only alternative to that, and why Labour in particular, I think, wants to spend so much time talking about this, the only alternative to that is the cuts that Labour and the Tories are proposing. If we want a genuine long-term alternative to austerity, then the more powers we have in our own hands to grow our economy and make a better future for this country, the better. In terms of... In terms of the, the second part of your question, Claire, we set out in this manifesto an alternative uh, approach to public finances. We reject the continued cuts of Labour and the Tories and we say that we want to see modest spending increases over the life of the next parliament in each year of the next parliament. Uh, we will still, under that plan, see the debt and the deficit fall in each year as a share of our national income, but we will, and we are saying this very openly, under that plan, we would take longer to completely eliminate the deficit. And what that does is make available an additional £140 billion to invest in things like our NHS, in economic growth, in lifting people out of poverty. We're also setting out in the manifesto revenue raising measures that we would support. I mentioned in my opening remarks the top rate of tax going back to 50 pence, support for a mansion tax, support for a banker's uh, bonus tax. So these are the ways in which we will fund all of the commitments in this manifesto and all of the commitment, spending commitments we make in this manifesto that we would vote for and push for at Westminster uh, are affordable uh, within that framework that we're setting out. We of course uh, also say where we would spend money differently and I use again the example of Trident. That's a very, very real way in which we can free up resources to spend on giving our children a better future. So this is a fiscally responsible manifesto, but it's one that also says we need to reduce the deficit in a way that does not tear up the fabric of our society. And I am proud to stand on that premise. Martin Geisler, ITN. First Minister, you said today that those with the broadest shoulders should pay a little bit more, but you haven't used the opportunity to raise tax in eight years in government here. In fact, can you remind us of a single meaningful redistributive policy you have implemented, taking middle class money and giving it to the less well off? Well, in terms of the tax raising powers, we don't have the power to raise tax on those with the broadest shoulders. At the moment, all we can do is raise the basic rate all we, all we can do right now is raise or lower the basic rate of income tax by three pence. And I wouldn't describe those paying the basic rate of income tax as those with the broadest shoulders. Now, the Scottish Parliament will be... The Scottish Parliament will, of course, be getting additional uh, tax varying powers starting uh, in 2016 and we hope uh, more to come after that and we will consider uh, in the normal course of setting our budgets, the Finance Secretary is here today listening very carefully, uh, we will consider how we use those tax varying powers that the Scottish Parliament has to meet the objectives that I'm setting out in this manifesto. In terms of the policies we have pursued, uh, progressive policies to help those uh, most in need of help, there are many uh, that I can cite. We've, for example, taken action uh, to ensure that council tax benefit is not taken away from the poorest people in our society. We're investing every year right now more than £100 million in mitigating the impact of Tory welfare cuts, including taking away 
entirely the impact of the bedroom tax. The council tax freeze proportionately helps those at the bottom more than it does those at the top. Unlike governments south of the border, we have retained educational maintenance allowances, allowing those from most deprived communities the opportunity to stay in and further their education. We have been and we will continue to be a progressive Scottish government and we will also argue for and vote for progressive policies in Westminster as well. Alec Thompson from Channel 4. Good morning. Um, why do you think the English are scared of you? <laughs> I, I don't I think they are. <laughs> If you want my honest opinion, although I shouldn't be uh, running the risk of giving David Cameron any unintended good advice, but I think he's making a huge tactical and strategic mistake in assuming that people are. Uh, my experience, and it's anecdotal, is that people across the rest of the UK are as hungry and restless for progressive change as people in Scotland are. And I think, I think we can play a positive part in helping to bring about that change. What, what I would say, and I've alluded to it already today, is that I, I take seriously my responsibility to say to anybody in other parts of the UK who may be suspicious about the motives of the SNP that we will play a positive and constructive role. Uh, because, dare I say it, I can understand uh, why some people in other parts of the UK may wonder why a party that wants independence for Scotland could play that constructive role. The answer to that is very, very simple. As long as we're part of that system, it matters to us that that system serves all of us better. And that's why we will play a constructive role. And my final, my final point, which I, which I should stress is entirely anecdotal, is that my inbox is heaving with people from other parts of the UK asking if they can vote SNP. Uh, and next is Andy Bell, Channel 5. Sorry. Thank you very much, Andy Bell, 5 News. If, uh, if a minority Labour government doesn't do what you want it to do, are you going to vote against them and risk putting the Conservatives in, or are you going to keep that minority Labour government in place and just torture them for five years? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do neither of those things. You know, let me, let me say this sincerely, and again, you know, in some respects my comments here are directed as much to people outside of Scotland as they are to people in Scotland. I am not, and the SNP is not going into this election, seeking the election of SNP MPs in order that we can go to Westminster to be in any way destructive or disruptive. I am not going uh, to Westminster, I am not going to Westminster at all. The SNP is not going to Westminster. The SNP is, is not going to Westminster to seek to bring down governments or block budgets. We are going to Westminster to build alliances for good, positive, progressive, sensible change. And we will do that constructively, looking to make common cause with people of like mind. I know, and I know this for a fact, that there are many, many people within the ranks of the Labour Party perhaps not in the Labour leadership, although uh, there is one shadow minister in Scotland who was quoted last week as saying he would never in any circumstances vote for the renewal of Trident. There are many people within Labour who I think hear what the SNP says and perhaps agree with it more than they agree with some of what their own leadership says. So we will... We will seek to build those alliances for change and as I've said, 
on many occasions during this campaign, as I said as recently as yesterday, the Fixed Terms Parliament Act gives parties the opportunity to do that, to seek to persuade governments to change on particular issues without bringing governments down. And it's that constructive role that we'll seek to play. Allegra Stratton from Newsnight. Nicola Sturgeon, um, following on from that question, if Ed Miliband chose to make his budget an issue of confidence in him, can you tell us now, would you support that budget? Look, we will seek to persuade and build alliances for the kind of policies we want to see to be in the budget. I I'm not going into this and I'm not going to be drawn into uh, implying that the SNP is going into Westminster to try to block budgets or bring governments down. We want to use our influence to make change and that's what we will seek to do. And the more SNP MPs we get elected on the 7th of May, the more influence we will have and the more able we will be to make that change. So that's my message. If you want Scotland's voice to be heard, if you want a Labour government's budget to be better, if you want a Labour government not to be Tory light, but to be bold and better and progressive, then vote SNP to make sure that all of these things can happen. I'll take a quick question from Peter McMahon from Border Television before uh, going on to the newspaper journalists. First Minister, uh, David Cameron is supposedly going to set out today what he's going to call the Carlisle Principle. In other words, that under a Tory government, a UK government would assess the impact of policies in Scotland on people south of the border. Could, you have, uh, could I have your reaction to that, please? Also, your manifesto says that we will back budget plans to invest more in infrastructure of Scotland and the north of England. Now, that might be very appealing to people in, say, the northeast of England, but can you be more specific, please? Well, firstly, in response to David Cameron's comments today, I, I think they are born out of panic and desperation on the part of the Prime Minister, frankly. Um, I also think they will uh, appall people across Scotland. They're a clear attempt to undermine the principle and the practice of devolution. There's also something of an irony uh, to hear the Prime Minister of a government that's racked up hundreds of billions of pounds worth of debt saying that it's going to, and I think the quote was, check the homework of a government that's balanced the books in every single year we've been in office. The whole point... The whole point of more powers for the Scottish Parliament is so that we can use those powers well and wisely to take good decisions, to get our economy growing and to reap the benefits of the revenues that result from that economic growth. We take the risk of exercising power in the Scottish Parliament. We should also reap the benefit when we get those decisions right. So I will oppose and the SNP will oppose any attempt by any Tory Prime Minister to undermine the Scottish Parliament. And I hope David Cameron hears that loudly and clearly today. And And on uh, the second part of your question, I'm very and you know I'm passionate about building more links between Scotland and the north of England, particularly the south of Scotland. You would be familiar with the Borderlands initiative, looking at how we work together to create more economic opportunity for Scotland and for the north of England. We set out in our manifesto uh, the objective and the desire to see uh, the economy of the UK rebalanced so that it uh, benefits those in the northern parts of the UK as much as it does those in the southern parts. And one particular example we've put forward is high-speed rail, wanting to see that go from north to south at the same time as it goes from south to north, so that it benefits Scotland and the north of England. And it's one tangible example of how we can work together to deliver that change. OK. I have a forest of hands. David Clegg, I think, is rising most quickly. David Clegg from the Daily Record. Uh, thank you. Um, two questions. One, given that you're 
most likely to be able to wield influence if there's a minority Labour government? Uh, will you call on people in England to vote Labour? Uh, and secondly, would you support the extra money for Wales called for by your friends in Plaid Cymru, uh, given you're also calling for their uh, keeping the Bournemouth formula? Okay, I, I'm not going to tell people in England how to vote, other than to say, look at your look at your candidates and vote for the most progressive candidate. If that happens to be a Labour candidate, then vote for that candidate. I want to be able to build progressive alliances in the House of Commons. And uh, the more progressive MPs we get there, including Labour MPs, the more in England, the more chance we will have of doing that. And I do support uh, Leanne Wood and Plaid Cymru's call for parity for Wales, uh, but not at the expense... But not, not at the expense of Scotland, because I do not accept that Scotland is subsidised, and I will argue passionately against that notion for as long as I'm in politics. But you know, the, the most important thing I would say in response to the first part of your question is this. In Scotland, we can only control in this election what we do. And if we want to make sure that Scotland's voice is heard in a way that it's not been heard at Westminster before, and if we want to make sure that all of the MPs we send to Westminster are arguing for the progressive politics and the progressive change that we believe in, then you have to vote SNP to elect SNP MPs to be that progressive voice for Scotland. So that is what I'll persuade people to do in terms of their voting practice on May the 7th. I don't think I'm grabbing any headlines with what I'm going to say here, but if you live in Scotland, please, please vote SNP. Yes, so I'm... Um, who's next? Who's got the microphone? Yes, sorry. Uh, yes. Thank you. Sam Coates from The Times. Um, uh, Sam Coates from The Times. Uh, you talk about wanting to stop a Tory-like government. Do you really think the rest of the UK wants a more left-wing administration than the one that Ed Miliband has to offer? And you're talking about trying to oust David Cameron and put Ed Miliband in as Prime Minister, and I'm interested in what you think of him. Do you think that he is as tough as Gordon Brown, as wily as Tony Blair? What do you make of him? Is he a strong opponent? <laughs> On the first part of your question, um, I, I think it's my opinion, but I'll, I'll express it. I think the fact that neither Labour or the Tories seem capable of winning a majority at this election, all of the polls suggest that neither of them is going to manage to win a majority, does suggest very strongly that people in England want something different from both of the them in terms of what they're offering uh, now. If that wasn't the case, then one or other of them would presumably be well on their way to, to winning a majority. The state of the opinion polls, I think, sends a very strong message that neither of those parties are offering what people want. I think in terms of Labour, that's because they're not offering a clear enough difference to the Tories. You know, Ed Miliband asked me at the debate last week uh, if I was really saying that there was nothing to choose between him and David Cameron. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's not enough to choose between him and David Cameron. And he should be... He should be bolder. In terms of uh, Ed Miliband, I, I've only now, I think, if my memory serves me correctly, met Ed Miliband on three occasions. I got into a bit of trouble last week when I said the first time was at the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games, and I ventured the view that, at that on that occasion I was more interested in watching the dancing tea cakes than I was in uh, speaking to other politicians. And that was not intended to be any slight on Ed Miliband at all. The same was true of Alex Salmon, so there you go. Um, can I say seriously, this, this is not about one politician being in the pocket of another politician or vice versa. I actually think it's about something better and more positive than that. I think it's about different politicians listening to what the voters say and coming together to work together to deliver the change that voters want. That's what I'm determined to do.
Hi there, Cameron Hi. Brooks, Press and Journal. Um, if uh, the SNP are in a position, will you make sure that Scotland's uh, Fisheries Minister will lead the fishing negotiations in any EU um, talks? And also, what message do you have to people, who, small business owners, who feel they will really struggle to pay the minimum wage of £8.70 an hour? Okay. Um, in, in firstly, in terms of the Fisheries Minister leading discussions, you know, Cameron, that is a position we have argued uh, long and hard over a long period of time. Uh, when there are matters being discussed in the European Union that directly affect the fishing industry in Scotland, it is, in my view, outrageous and unacceptable that the Scottish Fishing Minister does not lead uh, for Scotland in that respect. So, yes, that is something we will continue to advance as an argument. And again, the stronger, the stronger voice we have in Westminster, the more able we will be and the more likely we will be to prevail on arguments of that nature. In terms of your very legitimate and important question about small business owners, uh, I should say, firstly, the uh, pledge in the manifesto is to increase the minimum wage to £8.70 uh, by 2020. It's a phased increase, but it recognises that we must do more for those at the bottom end of the income scale to lift them out of poverty. Because if we do that, then we have fewer people dependent on tax credits and we save the country money as well. But I recognise, and I recognise through the work the Scottish Government is currently doing to promote the living wage through the living wage accreditation scheme, that often for small businesses, uh, their uh, inability to pay the minimum or, or well, the minimum wage is a legal requirement of course but inability to pay the living wage is not because they don't want to it's because they practically cannot so that's why the living wage accreditation scheme provides support and it's why in this manifesto we're making a very specific commitment to argue for and vote for further reductions in employers national insurance contributions to give them the support and the incentives to employ more people and to make sure these people get paid properly. Uh, my eyesight is starting to fail me. I, I, see, I, I see your hand, so I will come over here, but uh, yes. It's, uh, James Cusick from The Independent. James. Um, a bookmaker this morning offered me fairly decent odds that a second referendum would be held within the next five years. Do you think I should take the bet? Well, if my predecessor was standing here, he'd probably be able to give you some advice. I am not a betting person so I'm going to, uh, to uh, but no I don't think I, I would. I'm not planning another referendum. I have made that absolutely clear. I've also said that there is a democratic lock on the question of another referendum. Something substantive would have to change in our circumstances from the referendum last year to justify it being in a future manifesto and by that let me make clear I don't mean an SNP win in the Westminster election I am being absolutely clear if you vote SNP on May the 7th you are not voting to give the SNP a mandate for a second referendum so something substantial would have to change and then of course and then of course people in Scotland would have to vote for that manifesto to elect a government with sufficient strength in the Scottish Parliament to pass the legislation. I cannot impose a referendum on anybody. It's the people of Scotland who are in charge at every step of the way. Seb. Right, Seb, before that arm falls off, I'm going to allow you to ask a question. Severin Crowley, The Guardian. Uh, First Minister, was Stuart Hosey correct to say on the 28th of March that the SNP would expect to have advanced negotiations with Labour Party if they became a minority government on the SNP, on the Labour's Queen's speech? That you would expect to have some form of a veto on the Queen's speech? Look, I, I said earlier on, I am not uh, leading the SNP into this election. I will not lead the SNP into whatever scenario follows this election to try to block or disrupt or bring down. I will lead the SNP to be a constructive force at Westminster. And beyond that, all I would say is, is this. We can all, and it's understandable, and we're all uh, prone to do it at the moment, given the state of the polls, to get very caught up in what happens the morning after the 7th of May. People have to vote on the 7th of May first. And the SNP will only be in the position 
to wield any influence and to have any voice on Scotland's behalf if people on the 7th of May vote for their SNP candidate. So let's persuade people to do that first. And then when the votes are cast and we see what the numbers say afterwards, we will decide how we take things forward then. But the people have to be allowed their say before that happens. First Minister, Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Um, a formal coalition with Labour looks unlikely, but we may have, according to the hints we're getting, some kind of informal pact or arrangement. In that scenario, if you have 40 to 50 MPs at Westminster, would you want to see one of them maybe in the Scotland office as Minister of State? Um, I'm not... Uh... I don't think a formal coalition is likely. I, I've always said that. Ed Miliband says he doesn't want that either. So I do not envisage a situation where we have SNP ministers in a Labour government. And that really is not the motive for SNP MPs going to Westminster. We go to stand up for Scotland and to get the best deal for Scotland and to make Scotland's voice heard. And when we see how people vote and when we see the breakdown of the numbers the day after the election, we'll be able to judge how we best do that. But all I'll say, as I've said repeatedly, is we will do that always constructively and positively. But we're not there to get uh, ministerial positions. We're there to stand up for Scotland. OK, please... Uh, Pray silence for a young up-and-coming journalist, Mr Alan Cochran of the Daily Telegraph. First Minister, there's a lot of talk here about uh, negotiations perhaps with the, uh, an incoming Labour government. Are you going to base yourself in London for these negotiations on, say, May the 8th in the Caledonian Club, for instance? I can put you up for membership. Are, are you, you like. offering to put oh, me up, yeah, Alan? I'll put you up, happily. No, put you up for membership. You can't share. Uh, uh, will you take charge of these uh, negotiations personally? I know you've got a deputy uh, already, uh, possibly a member of the Westminster Parliament. You've also got a predecessor, I think, who might be there. Will you take charge of these negotiations or will you try and do it from 400 miles away? Uh, I am the leader of the SNP. I'll be in charge of any discussions, negotiations or whatever happens after the 8th of May. And that's my short answer to that. Got time for one. Time for one more. One more question. Uh, you, Dickie, from the Financial Times. Thank you, Muriel. Financial Times. Uh, you, in the manifesto, you refer to full financial responsibility, but in the past, the SNP has called for full fiscal autonomy. Can you tell us if there's any difference no. between the two? The same thing. And can you explain a little bit about your thinking of not prioritising that as a goal uh, in, in post-election um, uh, negotiations? Thank you. Um, no, I don't draw any distinction. It's a, a matter of terminology. I make the point and use the term financial responsibility to make clear that that's what we're seeking, the responsibility to grow our economy and increase our revenues as a country. Um, I set out very clearly that we will seek agreement to Scotland moving to financial responsibility. I'm simply reflecting the reality of the position. You know, the Cowman proposals were made in 2009 and it will not be until next year that the tax powers, the income tax powers that flow from these proposals uh, come into force. So it will take a period of time. What is really important then is that as part of that process, we prioritise early devolution of the powers that allow us to get to work as quickly as possible to grow our economy. And that, in terms of more powers, will be the priority that uh, SNP MPs give to those discussions. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can I, can, I thank, uh, can I thank you for your attendance here today? Can I uh, thank ladies and gentlemen of the press uh, for their attendance here today. To my colleagues in the SNP, can I uh, simply say this? Uh, none of this talk about what happens after the 7th of May will mean anything unless we win this election on the 7th of May. We... We take nothing for granted. 
we take not a single vote in this election for granted. To the people of Scotland, let me say this very clearly. Between now and polling day, we will work as hard as we can to earn your trust. And if you give us your trust on polling day, we will repay that trust by making Scotland's voice heard, standing up for Scotland, protecting Scotland's interests and being MPs in Westminster that you can be proud of. Thank you very much.